Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad to see everyone here. It's so glad to uh, meet again on this Sunday. And uh, I can feel there's a lot of joy in this room, which is awesome. So, yeah, welcome to the service this morning. We're going to enjoy it here in the presence of the Lord and each other. Um, and I want to give a special welcome to Drew and Shay, who's joining us today, and their family, and helping us and leading us in worship. So that's a great joy. Just quickly, some announcements. 
Uh, there's not really any announcements. If you just keep an eye on the social media of the church and there you'll find out everything you need to know. Or feel free to just phone the office as well if you have any questions. So that's our announcement. Another thing is the kids. They're going to join us for one song and then the kids can go out to Kids Church. So there's not going to be a break or so, but... Um, Awe will come in and they'll take the kids out to Kidsmen. So we're going to have one song that they'll join us for. And then the kids will go out to Kidsmen. And all the kids are welcome. If you are here for the first time, we want to say welcome. And then if you want to go with your kids just straight out of the hall through the cafe to the smaller hall, that's where the Kidsmen is. If you have any questions, just ask around and anyone will help you. Cool. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can gather here today in your presence, Lord. Thank you that you just are with us and that you bless us, Lord, and that we can just spend time with each other and then just worship you, Lord. Thank you for encouraging us today. Thank you for your joy that's in us and that's around us, Lord. Just, yeah, Lord, just be with us and fill us with your Holy Spirit. We welcome you here. Amen. Before the worship starts, I just want to share one little scripture with you. In Mark 4, verse 24, it says, And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. Um, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to those who has, more will be given. And for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So in the beginning, that one, that part that says, so Jesus said this, pay attention to what you hear. And when I was thinking about this, and it's speaking about understanding, if you have understanding, even more will be given to you if we have understanding. So let's pay attention to what he says and what we hear, and he will increase our understanding. So today, especially in worship, let's Hear what God says to us. Let him increase our understanding of him. Let him increase our understanding of who he made us to be. And, um, yeah, and then let's just be open for that, for what he says. So, yeah, I want to encourage you to open your ears and then your mouth while we worship. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Such a lovely privilege to be here this morning. Let's just stand... Rusty can give me a D. Let's just fix our gaze on Jesus right now from the beginning. You know, he's just so present and he wants to move among us. And Jesus, I'm just so grateful to you. I'm just so thankful to you to be here, to be standing here. I'm grateful to you, Jesus. Just thank Jesus. Thank him for every blessing. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We just gaze in wide-eyed wonder. And we remind ourselves that you never forget you never forget what you have said over me. I'm not the product of circumstance and I'm not dictated to by society. I'm in your hands. Thank you that we're in your hands, Jesus. I'm in your hands. Just let your heart start to overflow with gratitude. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that my life is in the center of your hands.
Just feel anxiety melt off you right now. Let it melt off you right now. Stand. Oh, in the center of his hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
It says, when you face trouble, when you face trouble, and Jesus said, you will face trouble of many kinds. But it is in those moments that you, we see that He is a good, good Father. And no matter what comes against you, there's something that rises up in you that is, a, that is the Spirit of God, and it is the fountain of God inside of you. And Jesus said, it's living water. And when the enemy comes in, the the Spirit of God raises a standard against it. And that is the protection of God in Psalm 91. It is the, the cover and the shelter that comes over us and stands up on the inside of us. So when we sing, you are good, even when I don't feel it, even when I don't see it, I know that despite the trouble that I'm facing, despite the trouble that I'm facing, it is not my trouble because He is good and he will, he will, he will, he will, he will, he will do all things, all things that turn for the good if I love him and I'm called according to his purpose and I know that I'm chosen and I know that I'm loved and I know that I will stick to you like a hand in a glove because that's who you are to me, who you are to me. So as we sing, you are good. Sing it because we know it. And because that is the standard that is announced to the enemy when he comes in and he comes and he tries and he tries and he tries and he tries and he flies in and he comes from under and he comes from every side but he will not he will not overcome why because you are good you're good oh.
sinking God you're holding on so I can let go God you're holding on of the things I don't know God is holding on oh I surrender all because you are holding Just feel his firm grip on you.
can I run from your presence? Where can I flee from you? Even if I hide on the highest mountain, you Where can I run from your presence? Where can I flee from you? Even if I lie on the lowest valley, you will find me there. Oh, no. 
comforter and friend. The one who says, go this way and go that. Let me hear the sound of your voice. Let nothing distract. Fill us now. Just drink tea For there are streams that are flowing to make you glad To make you glad Streams Streams is a holy place and I am holy for I am your habitation Just 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you love us, Lord. Thank you that your love is so complete, so overwhelming, Lord. Thank you for your love, Lord, that it goes on and on and on and on, Lord. Thank you that your love never ends, Lord. If we look back, we'll see that you've loved us always, Lord. And when we look ahead, we know that you will love us, Lord. And where we are now, Lord, we know that you love us, Lord, and your love is just for us. It's in us and around us and it overwhelms us, Lord. And we just honor you for that, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you just more. We want more of your love, Lord. And just saturate us, Lord. Just, ah, Lord, we just, we can't even love you back in the same way, Lord. But we love you. But you love us more. And we just honor you for that. Thank you, Jesus. Just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can take your seats. Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. I'm pretty sure we're all feeling loved. Yo, that was excellent. Um, today we have uh, two preachers. Yay. Two for the price of one. First up, we're going to have Pete Mayer. He's going to share with us um, while he's getting ready. I just want to share a quick story with you. Um, yesterday, I, win, I was getting out of my car at the shop's I uh, just heard this voice that said, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. But like a deep voice. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And I'm like, I'm cold. I'm like, there's no one around me who would say something like that. Then I realized my phone in my pocket um, pressed somehow on the Bible app, and it was on that verse, just that one verse. I said, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And um, I'm like, yes, I'm listening, Lord, I'm listening. 
And then a little bit later, so I switch it off, go on, a little bit later, I get out of the car again, same thing happens. I'm like, man, I'm listening, Lord. Now I'm listening, you know? And I'm looking around, what is there to hear? What is, and I suddenly, like God just reminds me that any time, in any moment, He can speak to us directly, you know? And there's no formula or certain way that He does it. Anyway, He'll just catch you in the moment. So I want to encourage you, if anyone here has an ear to hear, let him hear. Okay, thank you, Pete. Thank you very much, Werner. Good morning, everyone. So um, I just want to say um, thank you to, to Gus and um, yeah, generally um, Matt, uh, ASUS, people who had asked me to preach to, for me to share a little bit. And um, yeah, it's, it's really an honor to be here and to be doing that. Um, but mostly, uh, as, as one often hears, when one, when one does prepare something to share, very often, uh, it's actually God speaking to you. You know, <laughs> one always thinks uh, uh, one must share something that would be beneficial to those who hear it. And I trust what I'm going to share and what God has put in my heart this morning is going to be beneficial. But um, while I was even preparing, it's amazing how God speaks to you because, yeah, God is just God and, and God's amazing. Amen. So what I'm going to be sharing a bit today is um, just on, on my journey of freedom. Now, we, we are all on the journey of freedom. We know there's so much in the Bible that talks about freedom. Um, freedom is an amazing, amazing, amazing thing. This world obviously wants the opposite. They want to enslave us in, in which absolutely ever way they can. Whether a slave to money, a slave to work, a slave to addictions, a slave to uh, rules. Um, God wants freedom. And, and true freedom is found, what I've come to see, in a relationship with God. And... Um, However, even in the context of the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, uh, freedom is such a continuous theme um, and, and takes on so many dimensions. Um, and, and when in the New Testament, uh, in, in the epistles, uh, when what Jesus talks about, the departure point about freedom is firstly just freedom from Old Testament law. Then it goes further, freedom from sin, freedom from fear. It comes into our context, freedom from addictions, freedom from sickness, and the list goes on. And we know Jesus has come to make us free. Uh, that's a whole other teaching in itself. I think part of the challenge when I was preparing this was, does one go down this road? Does one go down that road? Because I think, as you'll see, there's so many themes that I'm touching on. And I think the big thing, and, and, and Sandy knows it, she, she says, well, you could make like 50 sermons into one sermon and don't try and teach 50 in one. So that was my challenge, to try and keep it simple. So firstly, I just want to say, because this is not about me teaching on something theological, this is a little bit I want to share about my journey. And we are all on journeys. We all, I believe, are on journeys of freedom. And I just want to share a small part of, of, of something that's been big in my journey. And that's been freedom from a sin mindset. And some of you may not know what I'm talking about because some of you may just have gotten saved, received Jesus, and you guys are just free. Like, what's a sin mindset? Why are you struggling with sin? Why are you struggling with guilt? But I can, I can say for a fact that's probably been one of my biggest struggles. Um, Jesus has freed me from sin. It's like amazing. Hallelujah. We have great praise and worship. And you feel on top of the world. Where's sin? Sin has been dealt with. But then you go somewhere else. I think it's one of the devil's favorite tricks is to accuse you, to point that finger and to say, yeah, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. Ooh, that thing. I'm not so sure about that. And you start feeling absolutely terrible, and it robs the life out of you. 
So my, a big part of my journey is being free from the sin mindset. And I'll share a little bit where it started. It was probably, sure, 10, 15 years ago even. And I was, I was down in, in Belito and um, chatting to my cousin, her name's Nadine, um, and she had just done Bible school, and I was really struggling with this whole sin thing. What's right? What's wrong? Is it okay to do this? Is it not okay? Because I wanted that rule. I wanted to know that if it's okay to go to a nightclub, then I can go with a liquor, clean conscience, and, <laughs> and, and enjoy myself. But, but sometimes there just weren't answers. So I was on this mission to, to find out what's okay, what's not okay, what's sin, and what's not sin. Um, I mean, can you believe it? Even in the one youth group I went to, um, the debate was uh, uh, with a girl, how far is too far? And because, boy, oh, boy, if you could find that right line, then you could do whatever you wanted to without any worries. But <laughs> who knows that God has a much better way. And, and, and that's where freedom starts. Freedom to walk in righteousness. Freedom to be a slave of righteousness and not a slave of sin. Freedom to not worry about what's right and what's wrong. So anyway, I was chatting to my cousin. And um, I was asking her this. What can you do? What can't you do? How can you? What's the formula? Where's, where's the line for like everything in life? Um, for example, uh, gossiping um, is a big one. When is it gossiping? And when is it sharing a constructive truth that may equip someone else? Because if you can convince yourself that gossiping is that constructive truth that's going to help someone else, then you can gossip with a clear conscience. I mean, how wonderful. <laughs> but but God's, God's way is bigger and higher than that. And... Um, yeah, so, so that was my journey. Um, so she shared a scripture with me, which I overlooked a lot of times. And this is probably what started this journey. And it's from Romans chapter 8, verse 2, uh, where it simply says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And, 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 you can write that scripture down, Romans 8, verse 2, and meditate on it. Ask God to speak to you. What is it saying? Because I didn't understand it initially. And I thought to him, and, and then, but I, I started meditating on it. I started breaking it down. So firstly, the law of the spirit of life. Once you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. You, you walk in a different dimension uh, because... Now you've got the Spirit. You, don't, you no longer do this, do that. You may not do this. You may not do that. All those, those, those Old Testament laws which have their place, they have their purpose. But God's got a higher way. When we follow the Spirit, um, we, we're not subject to those, those old things. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. Do this. Do that. Because the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And He is telling us. He is leading us. So... As it says here, it's the law of the spirit of life. He gives life. He sets free. And that is in Christ Jesus. When we receive Jesus and we are then included in Christ Jesus, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus. And then we are set free from the law of sin and the law of death. And when she told me that, I didn't immediately receive it. And I was just like, yay, I'm free. Yay, throw the formulas away. But it was the start of a journey. Um, a while after that, um, I had a dream. Um, and and, and I, was, I was, um, what's the word? I was, I was clothed in, in like these dirty robes. And, and I didn't know what it was. And then next thing, I was with clean robes and God was there. And I said, but why would I be with dirty robes in front of God? And then they clean robes. And, um, and I told another friend of mine, and she said, these dirty robes is what you don't need. 
the, Jesus has taken these dirty robes off. But you're trying to, you're walking with God, you're drawn to God, but the robes are dirty. And, and then I said, but what about the clean robes? So anyway, she said, no, she'll go and pray about it, what it means. And about two days later, she came back to me. And she said, those dirty robes, they were like oily and greasy. And, 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 and I was even standing in like a bit of a dark environment. She said, that represents like that sin hell. That you, that you in this bondage of sin, the sin mindset, almost, not like a, a hell hell, devil hell, but it makes your life hell. And she says, but you don't need to do that. Jesus has made you clean. And it's not even by yourself. It's Jesus who does it. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and again, then God said, you don't need to be in the this, in this sin hell, the sin mindset. So that was, that was where it started. So I've, I've already elaborated a little bit. What is a sin mindset? What is this, this bondage to sin? And as I've said already, it's basically, is this a sin? Is that a sin? Sin plaguing you the whole time. It probably comes a little bit from our upbringing, from our schooling, about rules and being legalistic, and you can't do this and you can't do that. And as I said, I was going on this journey of, well, maybe it feels wrong, um, or, or, or is it wrong? It feels wrong. Can I go on my feeling? And some of you who know me, I've got a bit of an analytical mind, and this was just driving me crazy. Add to the mix, false guilt. So I'm, I, 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 um, uh, I'm doing something, and there's like nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Maybe not gossiping, genuinely helping somebody. And then there's this little niggle that comes and says, yeah, but actually, what was your motive? And we know it's the devil behind this, and he's accusing you. What was your motive? And now suddenly I'm feeling guilty, and I don't even need to feel guilty. So as, as God was showing me his truth, you can hear the frustration that I'm, that I'm living with. And you, walk up, you, you wake up in the morning, you have a quiet time, you're feeling on top of the world, you're feeling, wow, God has set me free, and then this little sin thing comes. And it's, it, it really, really is bondage. Now, I know I'm, I'm seeing a lot of attentive eyes, but yeah, he, uh, uh, am, am I the only one, or can we relate to this? Is it common to the human condition? Maybe not an oasis, because we're a church of freedom. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so anyway, once I, I, once I could know what's a sin and what's not a sin, I would try and analyze it. I would put steps into place of not to try and do it again. You know? So coming back to that gossiping example, somebody really irritates you, and actually all you want to do, you want to go out and you want to gossip. Or not gossip, but you want to get it off your chest. Um, share it. Share the burden. Um, and I said, no, no, no. But do I really need to do that? Actually, I will just give it to God. But... That person irritated me so much that I just, as the word says, I var made <laughs> to somebody else. Sandy knows <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I, will, I will say, sorry, I, I just var made about that whole situation. And I said, no, I should have just talked to God. So I'm making rules. Don't var made, talk to God. And then when I obeyed that, disobeyed that rule because I was feeling just like weak and tired and I didn't have that self-discipline to talk to God, and I went and vomited about the thing that was irritating me. Jeepers. Then, then I just felt even worse. So this is just a downward spiral. And I want to say again, the good news is, is God and Jesus has made a way to set us free from this whole sin thing. Um, so as I was saying, I tried to make a whole lot of rules now not to sin. But actually, this was, this was just like being on a hamster wheel. Sometimes you think you're making some progress. Sometimes you even think, jeepers, I'm actually doing quite well. God's, God's actually quite impressed with me. And, and then you feel good about yourself. But, but then it's like that hamster wheel. But then you fall and you're actually back to square one. So this just gets exhausting and it's not God's way. 
So, spoken about then the guilt that comes with, the lack of peace. Um, sometimes because of the guilt, I couldn't carry on until I've dealt with this thing, until I've figured it out, until I've got my improvement plan that I never do the thing again and find forgiveness. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Thank you, one hand. <laughs> Alex, I see you smiling, so maybe you do. <laughs> So, where does this all come from? I've told you the problem, I've told you the issue, I've told you the guilt mindset. Where does this come from? It's probably got a little bit to do with my personality. And anybody else who's got a similar kind of personality, maybe you know what, I'll, uh, what I'm talking about. Always wanting to do things 100%. And maybe if I do it 100%, and even a little bit better, well, maybe, maybe then God will be happy with me, because... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing glory to him. But as we know that that's also not sustainable. Then the church that I grew up in. Now, I don't want to say anything about where I grew up. I don't even know if this was essentially church doctrine. But this, this was the message that I got in the church growing up. And I was diligent in the church. Boy, oh boy, I wanted to do everything exactly right. <laughs> So, you could only be forgiven if, number one, you confessed your sin. Number two, once you confessed it, you then had to repent, which means basically turn around from it. And then, number three, you had to identify the sin, because how can you confess and repent of something that you can't identify? So, I had a bit of a problem, because... If I didn't know if it was a sin or if it was not a sin, how could I confess and repent? Okay, by this stage, somebody thinks I might need a psychologist. <laughs> Thanks for the confidence, my darling. <laughs> so, so, anyway, let me, let, let me get back to, to, to my notes. So, what I had to do as well, and now this is where fear comes in. Because if I didn't repent, if I didn't confess, I couldn't be forgiven. And if I wasn't forgiven, then and I get run over by a bus, then I'll go to hell. But, but I had a solution here. I would repent in advance. Because God knows my heart. I can repent in advance. And then I'm all right if a bus hits me. But, but actually, this is crazy thinking. I actually sometimes, looking back, wonder how I functioned with daily life. And sometimes I still actually managed to have joy. But, you know, this is, this is where God comes in, in his amazing, amazing grace. Um, that, that he has a better way. I also used to tell myself that if in the past I did something wrong and it was done in ignorance, in other words, I didn't know it was wrong. Like I actually could go to the nightclub, not that I was big on the nightclubs, but it's a good example. Like, I could go to the nightclub, and actually, it was a, a good thing because you could meet somebody, and you could maybe preach the gospel to them. So, the nightclub was all right, you know? Um, plus, you look cool, you get seen there a little bit, and it boosts your image, and maybe you build a relationship, and afterwards, uh, when you see that same person, because this was like varsity days, you see them the next week, they can relate to you, and you can talk about Jesus. So if, this, if the so-called wrong thing was done in ignorance, um, then I didn't feel bad about it. But when I got that revelation that the nightclub was bad, boy, oh boy, now I was in a problem. Because now I knew better, and now I had to make a rule about it. So, yeah, this was, this was just crazy. It had the best intentions. It was probably part of practicing righteousness. And if you want to write down another scripture, 1 John 2.29 says that <clears throat> uh, if, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So yes, we are born of God when we receive Jesus. We do practice righteousness. So I maybe wasn't entirely on the wrong track because the seed of God that's inside of me was practicing righteousness. But... I had the wrong end of the stick. 
Nothing wrong with practicing righteousness. That is part of God's plan. But if you're practicing righteousness for approval in God's sight, that's where I think we can go wrong. That's where I think we can be deceived. So, I came to know that this was not God's plan of being free, as I've said already. And free indeed, John 8, 36, where it talks about that Jesus has come to make us free and free indeed. And having an abundant life. This sin thing, that was not part. I, I, I really got that, that revelation of what God intends for us. So, I asked myself, what would it look like? What would it feel like if I did not have to worry about sin again? If I just lived and was free? If I did not have to analyze or feel guilty? So bear in mind what I've just told you. I asked myself this. Can it be possible to not feel guilty, to not think about sin? Um, and obviously then I went to God and I saw a few scriptures and God said, absolutely, my son, that is my plan for you. Okay, so again, I had not won the battle yet, but I was making some progress. God had started speaking to me. God was showing me there was a better way. But you won't believe how entrenched you get in old thinking. And I know that's where Trish with Sozo uh, uh, really knows that God can even change patterns of old thinking. Because God speaks to you with a good truth. You read it, 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 sets, it can set you free or it can start a process, but it's that old thinking or the devil who loves to come with his finger and, and, and get you back to that old place. That's also when I started getting a revelation of grace. Now, there's a, a hundred definitions of grace, and grace just has so many angles. But for me, what grace meant was where my forgiveness and my acceptance by God and His goodness does not depend on me or my actions, but purely that I have Jesus. Amen. I'll say it again. Grace, where my forgiveness and acceptance by God and His goodness, so not just our forgiveness and acceptance, God's goodness to us does not depend on me or my actions, but purely that I have Jesus. What I also come to see, that repentance and confession of sins, that got me into such a mental knot, um, was, was actually not, as far as I can see, um, a, a, a biblically correct interpretation, how we were taught in church. But repentance and, and confession actually has to do with when we turn away from our old lives and come to Jesus. Not, this is a sin I need to confess. This is a sin I need to repent. Um, repentance and confession, because I studied this, and if anybody's got any different view, please come and talk to me. But I looked through the Bible, and the, when they talk about repentance and confession, it's, it's about when the, the moment you come to Jesus, you confess your sins, and you say, Jesus, I need you. I've, I've got sin. I need you to take the sin away. Not every day when you've, when you've done a sin. Because we're practicing righteousness. We're turning around in any case. We're turning away from sin in any case. We don't need to burden our minds from it. Repentance means turning from our old lives and turning to Jesus. And because when we become children of God, we practice righteousness. We turn away from sin. Repentance means turning away, changing your mind. And that happens in any case. You don't need to be burdened with it. And when I got that revelation, uh, boy, oh boy, I just, as soon as you get this little guilt about something, thank you, Jesus, I'm free. Thank you. It's because of what you've done, not what I've done. Um, and God's forgiven it. So why am I worrying about it? And you carry on moving. So <clears throat> the, the, other, the other thing that I learned is I, didn't, I don't need to constantly improve because I really thought that if I'm constantly improving, then God's going to be happy with me. Yes, as I've said again, we do need to grow. There's sanctification and all these other doctrines. 
and practicing righteousness and improving and growing and learning. But our acceptance is just because of Jesus. Our acceptance is not by constantly improving. I think somewhere I heard that. You might not be perfect, but as long as you're constantly improving, well, then you can pat yourself on the back. But that's not God's economy. Jesus, Jesus has already made us clean and new. And I just want to share the last scripture, um, which says it's all about Jesus. Romans 3, ver verse 22 and 24, where it says the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. What's the righteousness of God? It's God's standard of righteousness. It's God's level, not our level. It's from God. It's not from us. We don't manufacture it. And it comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So when we believe, God's righteousness is with us. We have God's righteousness. The devil wants to come and say, ah, you've done this, you've done that. I say, sorry, devil. I have God's righteousness. You see this here? It's God's righteousness. You, your, your, your accusation has no power. Amen. And then verse 24 says, And we are justified by His grace as a gift. If I, if, if, if I give, what can I give here to Sean here? Sean, here's, here's this cup of water. It's, it's your gift. You haven't done anything for me today, but I've given it to you. <laughs> That's how God gives us. Um, his, his, his justification, that means the right standing. It's given to us by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That means the saving that comes from Jesus. When we receive Jesus, we receive that righteousness. We don't need to be burdened by sin. It does not depend on us. And as you can see how excited I am, this is the real good news from when you've come from a place like I've come. And I just want to encourage um, anyone who's here, I encourage myself, if you're relating to anything um, that I'm talking about, might not, you may not have been down this serious bad sin and guilt hole that, that I've been down. But if any part of it, when we receive that gift of righteousness, when we receive um, that justification, that comes as a gift, put into right standing by God, and we know it doesn't depend on us. Boy, oh boy, that changes the way we think. That changes our mind. So how do we get there? Because I always like to make things practical, and I'm almost done. Firstly, I thought at one stage repeating Bible verses is the way to do it, because also that was taught somewhere. Now, just, just, just when, you feel that, when you feel bad, repeat that Bible verse. Leanne, don't look so concerned. There's value in repeating Bible verses. But I repeated Bible verses and it helped to a point. Not saying it's bad. Trying to tell yourself the definition of grace. It's also not bad. What's the definition of grace? Receiving something you don't deserve. But those kind of things, telling yourself statements like that, will also only help you to a point. Maybe making peace with yourself that you will never fully understand grace and embrace that. That might help you further because to understand grace, it goes beyond our, our minds, actually. God can give us a revelation, but it's difficult to understand grace. So what, what would be more helpful? Firstly, just be in a relationship with God. Seek Him. Draw close to Him. Remain in his love. As 1 John 4 verse 18 says, there's no fear in love. Even if you don't know all the theory about righteousness and grace and justification and all these big words, when we come to God and we remain in his love, the fear goes away because he's our good father. And secondly, learn something from children. And I've learned this from my children, is I've never, I've never had this mindset that they still need to reach a certain level before I'll give them pocket money or reach a certain uh, uh, standard of obedience um, before I'll love them properly. 
from the moment they were born, before they could do anything right or wrong, they had my whole acceptance, my whole love. And how much more does God love us? Irrespective of what we do. And I think sometimes we need to say, God, just remind us that we are your children. And lastly, God does the work to make us clean and acceptable to him. Therefore, now here's the really good part. What's our response? We can just relax. How's that? We don't have to do anything. We loved. Often we, we, we told, well, let's go out and be salt and light. And yes, we must. But that flows in any case. It's got nothing to do with our acceptance to God. That's after we've received this amazing love that we just want to give it onward. Because God loves us and accepts us all just because of Jesus. And so we can relax. Jesus has done it for us. And we can ask God, Lord, put your grace inside of us. Your Holy Spirit is inside of us. Flood us with your love. Flood us with your grace. Let us know we're forgiven. And let us just relax. Because my children out there on the playground, they can come to me anytime. I can arrive there. They're not going to be asking themselves, Ooh, have I done all, everything right this morning? Have I made my bed? Have I listened to my mom? It's another theme in our house. <laughs> they'll just see me on the playground there when I arrive there, and they'll come and they'll give me a hug. And so much more can we come to God knowing that we don't need to run through a checklist. Have we done right? Have we done wrong? We are clean and new in His sight. And so that's, that's a little bit of my journey. That's a little bit what God has spoken to, <clears throat> to me. Unfortunately, very often, those old mindsets can come in very quickly. And I'm pressing into God to ask Him to continually renew our minds, as the Bible says, to help me to walk in that freedom. So, in response to this, I just quickly, I feel to, to pray. If, if that's you, if anything that I've spoken about has been something on your heart, something that you've struggled with, I really just want to pray for you. There's, you don't need to stand up, you don't need to raise your hand. But I really want to pray and ask God that He'll, change our, that, that, that he'll show us something new, that He'll show us grace, that He'll show us acceptance that's not dependent on who we are or on what we do. Let's pray. Lord God, you know our hearts. You love us, Father. We've sung so much even this morning about your incredible love and how you touch us and how you help us, how good you are to us. And Lord, thank you that it's just totally out of grace. Thank you that we don't need to earn it. Thank you that it doesn't depend on us, Lord. So, Father, I pray for anybody here today, Lord, including myself, Lord, that you shower our hearts, our minds, with grace, Lord, with what it means to be forgiven and a forgiveness that doesn't even depend on us and that we can live in freedom like that. Come and do your work in us. Come and make us free, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. And um, over to Werner. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Our next uh, yeah, sermon will be from Sanao. While he's coming up, I just want to ask the helpers to help with the collection of the tithes and offering, please. Um, there's no rule in this, you know, God leads you or you decide how you're going to give and what you're going to give, but we'll also use this as a measure to see how good Pete's preach was, so just keep that in mind. But as the boxes come around, and then over to Sinao, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, I'll try and be um, as short as I can. I've got 10 minutes, and I'll add 10 more PEE minutes. <laughs> and <laughs> is, is that OK? Oh, you're so generous. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Vanda. All right. Um, I've just, um, I've been privileged to, um, to coach rugby. And um, it's been a great joy, um, you know, to coach young men. I've, I've, I've been privileged to coach in high school, I mean, in club. And one of the fundamentals that we instill in young men is that we try and teach them uh, as, as, as often as we can, um, who the real enemy is, who's the real opponent. Because when we miss that, we end up, they end up fighting amongst each other, thinking that their teammates are the enemy, thinking that, you know, uh, one of their buddies is actually the opponent. So from an early age, we try to drill, um, you know, to build that chias from these young boys and say, you know what, your mate is actually your mate. And the test of if they know, and this has been instilled properly, we always see it when they're under pressure. So when there's a lot of pressure, that's when you see that they've actually, you know, understood this backbone of the game, that we know who the real enemy is. Even if my teammates, my teammates mess up, I know who the enemy is, okay? And we can only see this when they are under pressure. So, without taking any further time, it is at a time in Israel where they are under pressure. People are being beheaded. People are being killed. And Peter writes a letter, in his first letter, we'll just go straight to Scripture, First Peter chapter 5, we'll read two verses. It's First Peter 5, and then I'll just read um, from verse 6 up to verse 8, and he says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Then he says something great. He says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Then he speaks of something that we'll be talking about today. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Amen. Okay, so, so Peter is trying to instill character in the people of, of, in the Jews. That, you know what, guys? I understand that, you know, people have been killed and some are going back to Judaism. Some are actually saying, you know what, I, I think I did believe in Jesus. But now that I'm seeing people being killed, now that I'm seeing families being scattered, now that I'm seeing a lot of pressure, I, I don't think I actually believe in this Jesus. And Peter tries, tries to instill this great character in the Jews. And he's saying that, you know what? I want you to understand. I want you to be vigilant. I want you to be sober. And he uses these two terms or these two words that might look similar, but they actually mean two different things. He says to them, I want you to be sober. Now, we do know what the opposite of sober is. <laughs> you know, it actually means being drunk. It means that some of your senses cannot work properly. It means that instead of talking properly, you actually talk slower, some faster. And some, the volume goes up, and some, the volume goes down. Right? And, 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 and so Peter is as if he looks at this and he says, guys, don't mess up with your senses. Make sure all of your senses are working properly. Be sober all the time. 
And then he says this. He says, I want you to be vigilant. And the opposite of actually vigilant, if you oversimplify it for all of our understanding, is sleeping. So he says, I don't want you to be asleep. I don't want you to underestimate the enemy. Because, and he explains it, he says, he is walking around and he's roaring like a lion. And he's not walking around for the sake of walking around. He actually wants anyone who's available to devour. So who's the enemy? It's not your ex-husband, your ex-wife. Who's your enemy? It's not the government. It's not the looters. Could have taken your business, messed up your business, but who's the enemy? It's not your ex-pastor who offended you. That's not the enemy. It's not your children. It's not your stepchildren. So the enemy must always be clear with us. And Peter's drilling them. He's saying, it's not the Romans that are killing you. They're not the enemy. The real enemy, and he says it, is the devil. He might be using other people. He might be using the government. He might be using ESCOM. He might be using Transnet. But Transnet is not the enemy. So it's important that we never forget who the real enemy is. Especially when we are under pressure. And I want us to understand why would Peter use this metaphor. Peter would have seen a lion, not like us in zoos, eh? where you go to the zoo and look at a lion. Peter would have looked, seen a lion actually being fed other human Christian beings. So he knows the danger of the lion. He knows it's raw when it's caged, waiting for another Christian, you know, to devour. He's heard it. Not the ones that we, you know, that are in the zoo, no. So he's seen, he's seen a lion rip human remains. And the funny thing about lions, they, they save their energy as much as possible. Look at them during the day. They just sleep with their bellies up. Or with their six packs up like my one. And, and so what they do is that they try not to waste their time. They save their energy as much as possible. They only use that energy when they're going for the kill. And they try to use as much time to study their prey as much as possible. And the devil studies our appetites. It can take 60 years to study your appetite. It can take 20 years to study our appetites. All he's waiting for is that perfect moment where you are saying, you know what? I give up. This Christian thing is not for me. And you give up. And he comes and he devours. And so, what I've found out is that lions actually, when they trying to look at their prey, they only go for, most of the time that is, three types of prey. That's the easy target. They use a lot of their time assessing a group of deers. And one, they look for the young. And they can see that that one is not experienced. That one is young. That one is not growing as much as the other ones. And so it's important that we must yearn to grow in the Lord. For if we stay on milk and stay as children in the Lord, we will become targets of the enemy. And what makes us grow in the Lord? Unfortunately, it's not more years spent in church. Unfortunately, it's not all the things that we think it is. What gives us growth in the Lord is spending time 
with your master every day. My water has been taken by Sean. <laughs> the grace is not sufficient for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, he will always go for the young. Those that are not growing. Secondly, he would go for the isolated. Those that are running alone, saying, no, I don't need to go to church. I can do this thing at home. No, you need the church. You need your brothers and your sisters. You see, isolation, it, it makes you vulnerable to the enemy. <coughs> Excuse me. So it goes for the isolated because some, most of the time they're overconfident. Most of the time, time they're thinking, I've done this thing for years. I don't need them. And so isolation is not always a, a physical thing. You can be around us and still be isolated. I don't need a comp group. Last time I was in a comp group, I was offended. You know, those people are just in my business. You need people. You need them. You know, a comp group just got joined by this guy I don't like. I'm not going there anymore. Go to another one then. Because you need people. So, it's important that when we are isolated, we recognize that our backs are exposed. And the lion is looking at you. And he's studying your appetite. Lastly, the lion looks for the injured. Those limping ones. He looks at the deer that can't walk properly. That one carrying offense. That one carrying unforgiveness. And as soon as you carry that unforgiveness and you make it your own and you own it up and you say, you know what, I, I'd rather die than forgive him. You are actually putting yourself, you know, as supper for the lion. And so it's important that we understand when we've got some things, things in our hearts. Because unforgiveness is like cancer. It's like drinking poison and expecting the next person to die. You, you are carrying that and you die slowly inside. And it, it, it's, it's, when you forgive someone, whatever they did to you, it's not easy to forgive. Eh? It's not easy to forgive. But it's very necessary for you to forgive. That's important. So, I want to share something. And I want to close with, with this. If you can go to the next slide for me. Okay. I'm, I'm closing. In 1952, um, a lady called Victoria gave birth to her first daughter, her first child. And when she gave birth to this lady, or her first daughter, the father was a very fair looking colored guy whose father was a white guy. And so, you know in 1952, South Africa, four years after 1948, that was not allowed. You could not, regardless of how in love or head over ills you are, you know, someone who's another race, couldn't do that. And so when Victoria came home to her mom and said, I've been in a relationship with a guy, with a colored guy, a very fair-looking colored guy. And the mother, her mother shouted at her. Eventually forgave her. Two years later, 
Victoria got pregnant again. But the same guy. And her mother said, you know what? I would rather abort this child instead of giving birth to them. Because the system in the country does not allow me to have this child. And, and when that happened, back in the townships, you could not just go for safe abortions, go to a gynecologist. There were ladies that were known that used to do these abortions. And you used to drink Jay's fluid for you to do the abortion. And so she tried to abort the child. But guess what? The child just grew inside her belly. To cut a very long story short, eventually the child was born on the 6th of Feb, 1954. And a few seconds later, the child actually had fits and had a stroke and her face was a bit deformed. Her right eye didn't work properly because the Jay's fluid had eaten her up in her mother's belly. And so this grandmother was, or this lady, Victoria, who gave birth to this child, was bitter to the system. She was angry at herself for trying to abort her child. And the child was hidden. You see what happens in township if you give birth to a child that is not normal, right? You hide them behind the door so that no one else can make fun of them. And so she grew as one of these children or one of these kids that were hidden, that was, you know, behind closed doors, and no one, nobody knew about them. And so this, this child grew with this bitterness of saying, you know, the system failed me. My, grand, my mother failed me because my mother tried to abort me. I don't look like other kids. My right eye doesn't work properly. I've got an injection I have to take every month. Long story short, child grew and doctor said she would not be able to study. She, actually, she did. She found Christ. She forgave her mother. She forgave the system. She forgave the National Party. And you know what happened? She was told she will never have children. She must never get married. Guess what? She went to varsity. She passed. She got married. Something she was told she must never do. You know what? That was the fruit of her forgiving the system. Because when we forgive, we allow God to manifest great things in our lives. Go to the next slide for me. And that lady is my mother. And guess what? That bitterness was transferred to me. I was bitter. I was angry. I couldn't walk with my mother in malls or in public. Couldn't. I was a child. I was embarrassed because people were pointing at her because her face is, is not like other people's faces. And kids, as mean as they are, they would laugh at me. I was bitter. I, I, I wished I was alive, you know, in 1948 when they said, you know, you cannot have interracial relationships. I wish I was in parliament. I carried this bitterness inside me, saying, you know what, I will, I, I will make sure that if I see a white person in front of me, they would pay. I hated the National Party. And so I went to varsity, and I studied journalism, and I majored in political science with that bitterness. And I found Christ. And when I gave my life to Christ, and I said, you know what? He says in verse 7 here, cast your cares upon me. Peter says, cast up your cares upon him, for he cares for you. 
I took my unforgiveness. I took my bitterness. I took what I carried. All that anger and I gave it to him. And I'm telling you today, I miss Sean more than I miss my black brothers. And, and it's amazing when you allow forgiveness to flow. It is a gift that you must give yourself. If you carry unforgiveness, even if he raped you, if you carry unforgiveness, even if they forced you to go to the army, if you carry unforgiveness, even if he divorced you, even if he left you with kids and he doesn't care anymore, If you carry unforgiveness, you are angry at God for taking your partner. You need to let that out. For he cares for you. And you'll see the fruit of forgiving coming out. And you'll change the attitude of saying, this country is just going to the dogs. You know, I hate what's happening. And you'll understand who the real enemy is. It's not PE. That's not your enemy. My heart is for the spirit-filled white Christian to champion the fight on land. It is to see the spirit talk to a white person who owns hectares and hectares saying, I'm giving my two hectares to a black family. And my heart is seeing black, spirit-filled Christians saying, I don't care what they did. I don't care who is more empowered than who. I forgive them and I love them. And that black, spirit-filled Christian championing the fight on authentic reconciliation I would have done and achieved my purpose when I see that happening but it all starts with us opening our hearts and letting God do the work let's pray Heavenly Father thank you so much for being good thank you for your grace thank you Lord for the word you've placed on Peter's heart Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to work for your grace. It is a gift that comes from you. And we thank you, Jesus, that we've been blessed. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us to hear the message today. And indeed, Lord, like Werner said, let all who have ears hear your word. And Lord, I pray that you be with us. And Lord, when the enemy tries to steal this word from our hearts, may he not succeed. We give you glory, Lord. And we cast all of our anxieties, our fears, um, um, to you, for we know that you care. We bless you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Snow. Thank you, Pete, for those messages. Um, yeah, let's go out. Let's... Um, have a righteousness consciousness. And um, let's watch out for those lions. So if you want to get involved in a com group or want to get involved in the church, please, there's an info desk right there. You can get all the information there. And um, if you need some prayer, please come to the front. We'll be here for some prayer. And now, bless you. Have a good week. See you next week. Cheers. Amen. <laughs>
known me longer than anyone else. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Stand it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't even comprehend it. But I know you see. the depths where I I'm fearfully 